Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the February Lunch and Learn. Um, we're glad you're here with us. My name is Ali Schlant with the Meadow Center. I'm going to be helping uh, facilitate this today. Um, we're just going to ask that you keep yourself muted as you're coming in to kind of help reduce background noise and feedback. And it is completely up to you if you want to keep your video on or off. And we're going to be using the chat function today if you have any questions during um, our presentation that we'll be keeping an eye on. So you can enter in any questions you have in the chat while the presentation is going and we'll be keeping an eye on that and help get those out to our speaker when it's time. And if you want to go ahead and take the time to use the chat now and introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, where you work or what organization with, we'd love to hear that from you guys. And we'll be getting started in a few minutes. My light just turned off and I will go turn that back on, but we'll be getting started in a few minutes. Okay, this is Joe Hinojosa. I just wanted to verify that y'all can hear me. Uh, I'm on board right now. I can hear you, Joe. Okay, 10 4. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Joe Hinojosa. I'm the current general manager for the Santa Cruz Irrigation District. I'm also the chair for the uh, Stormwater Task Force for Rio Grande Valley Storm, uh, MS4 Stormwater Task Force. It's a long, long title, so of it. but anyway, that's the long and the short of it. So pleasure to be with you all this morning. I hope everybody's well. Great to hear from you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in with introductions? I think that's what I heard, something about introductions. Hi, it's Sharon Bailey Murphy with the City of Corpus Christi. I'm the Environmental Affairs Manager. Uh, yeah, everybody knows you already, I guess. And if you yeah. don't feel like speaking out, you can just go ahead and pop it in the chat too for everyone to see. Yeah, Jason's going to do a little intro. Hey, Melissa. Hi, this is Brenda Lizondo, uh, Nueces County Emergency Management. I'm dad, so I'm going to change my name there so everybody knows who dad is. Sorry about that. My phone is stuck on that moniker for some reason. Joe, because you are our dad, you know that. Okay, we are one minute from 11 and we still have a few people trickling in, but to make sure we get started on time, I'm just going to go through some housekeeping again. Um, again, my name is Ali Schlant. I'm with the Meadow Center and I'll be helping kind of facilitate this lunch and learn today. And I guess if you are here for the February Clean Close Texas Lunch and Learn series, you are in the right place. So we are just going to ask that you keep yourself muted during the presentation to help with background noise. And it is up to you if you want to keep your um, videos on or off. Um, and we're going to be using the chat function today. So if you have any questions during the presentation, go ahead and throw them in the chat. And we will keep an eye on that and make sure your question gets answered during, during the Q&A session. And if you want to introduce yourself, go ahead and put that in the chat. You can say your name, where you're from, what organization or you're with, or where you work. And I guess. That is all I have for you guys right now, and it's 11. So I'm going to pass this over to Jason Pinchback with the General Land Office. And he's going to get us started and introduce our speaker. So Jason, if you want to take it away. Thank you so much, Allie. Good morning. My name is Jason Pinchback. I work in the Coastal Resources Department at the Texas General Land Office. 
Thank you for choosing to spend some time with us today to talk about coastal non-point source pollution and how to uh, guide and develop a partnership network to respond to coastal water quality issues. The Clean Coast Texas program is a collaboration with the Co Coastal Management Program and the Coastal Resiliency Master Plan. So we're working together in partnership with many different jurisdictions and planning organizations along the Texas coast around how can we work collectively to help increase and improve the management of non-point source pollution. Knowing that there's not a one size fits all solution, there are many different options um, that could be employed. And so we'll be exploring some of those today with uh, Javier and his organization. And, and for those of you who have, who have worked on water quality issues and, and non-point source issues, you realize that there's not a one-stop shop. There's not necessarily one particular formula that is gonna work for fixing or uh, remediating your water quality issues. There can be uh, often hundreds, if not thousands of different types of approaches that can be incorporated. And we know that nobody does that alone. No one organization does that alone. It really is a true partnership and a true team network. Not only that, sometimes successes in improving water quality are hard to come by. Javier Guerrero with his organization um, over, the, over time have done a fantastic job at um, developing a coalition and focusing a coalition over decades. So I'd like to introduce Javier. Javier Guerrero is currently serving as the Chief Project Development Officer for a local private public partnership research institute with the offices in New York State and in South Texas. The research applied technology, education and service Rio Grande Valley, it's also known as RATES, is a Texas nonprofit organization founded in 2005. Mr. Guerrero serves as the board of directors. He serves on the board and is also a co-founder of the local office in Edinburgh, Texas. Mr. Guerrero founded the Lower Rio Grande Valley Tip D's Stormwater Task Force in 1998. This is a coalition of 30 local governments. Today, the task force has merged with rates and we celebrate 25 years of existence. Mr. Guerrero worked for the city of McAllen engineering department in the 1990s. And he's also served as a local councilman. So we invited Javier and his organization to share with us some of the things that, that helped them be successful, to share with us some of the uh, challenges that they, um, they had to deal with over the time. And um, it's one thing to build a group, but it's quite another thing to maintain it and grow it over time. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Javier Guerrero to share his presentation and to join us here for Clean Coast Texas Lunch and Learn. Thank you, Jason. Just wanna confirm that you can hear me and see the slide up there. I, I do hear you, but I do not see a slide yet. Okay. Okay, we're transitioning. Yes, we're transitioning now. And if you go into presentation mode, we should be good. How's that? There we go. We're great. Thank you. Yeah, there's a little uh, a lag time, I guess, on my end. Anyway, thank you, Jason. Um, let me just re jump right into it. Do want to reiterate, uh, Jason, that uh, this PowerPoint was presented to me this morning by one of my students. So I don't know how long or how short it is. So keep an eye on the on the clock, see if it is too long, I'll speed up, slow down, what have you. Yes, sir. Let me uh, introduce uh, Joan Hosa, who's with us today, and Melissa Gonzalez is with us also. Uh, Joe serves as a chair, Melissa serves as a vice chair, and I'm gonna ask them to uh, jump in anytime uh, they think that I missed something or, or maybe uh, should have elaborated a little bit more. Okay, guys. This is the coalition, the um, comprised of uh, cities. If you see there, counties, cities, drainage districts, irrigation districts. Uh, we've been together since uh, 1998. Let me go back here if, at the bottom of the little asterisk. Each task force rep is appointed by uh, their respective council or uh, commissioner's court or board of directors. So they, they do have decision-making authority during the course of uh, either work groups, meetings, what have you, it's been very successful. Uh, we, we did add the Laguna Madre Estuary Partnership down there. Augusto has two hats. He works for the Cameron County, but he also represents uh, um, uh, the Estuary Partnership down there. Uh, rates, uh, let me give you a little bit background on rates. Rates is a, a nonprofit group. We, we provide a lot of research support to a lot of local universities here in South Texas. 
Uh, we, we do have an additional board member who, and I don't know why he's not up there, Hollis Rutledge. He's uh, from the Mission, Texas area. He, he did join us a couple of years ago, but uh, he has been instrumental in a lot of the work that we do down here in the state of Texas. Let me, let me go over a little timeline uh, before I get into some of the uh, content. We, we founded the task force in 1998 uh, while we were stationed at uh, the South Texas Environmental Institute, which is part of the A&M system. And uh, I was working with the city of McAllen at that time. I was recruited by Dr. Ernest, who uh, happens to be the chair of the, uh, I mean, the CEO of rates. He was a department head up there and I became uh, one of his first graduate students um, and managed the uh, first TB TMDL project in the area. In 2003, uh, we transitioned into the Institute of Sustainable Energy and, and we relocated to the A&M Kingsville Citrus Center down in West Echo, Texas, which is a beautiful campus. We just, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, built a two or three story building up there. So you haven't been out there. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful campus. 2016, we, um, we moved the task force to the Civil Engineering Department at UTRGV. If you all recall, or, or maybe uh, you don't, but uh, back in, uh, 2013, I think that date is wrong, but back in 2013, uh, UT Brownsville and UT Pan American were dissolved. The reason being they wanted to tap into the rainy day fund and there was some stipulation that uh, money was available, but only to new universities. So UTRGV was born in 2013. Uh, and long behold, Dr. Ernest, uh, my colleague, uh, became the chair there at the department and, and uh, enticed us to, to join him at uh, UTRGV. So we, I took my whole team, everyone, including students to, to UTRGV. And we started a master's program there, which I'm very proud of. Uh, we we uh, graduated the first two kids about two years ago, master's in civil engineering. Um, uh, uh, one female, one male, and the female, by no coincidence, was, was my daughter. So uh, she's, she's been, she's uh, working down here in the Valley as an engineer. And been part of the task force as well. In 2019, the coalition merged with rates, and that occurred because, uh, you know, UTRGV was was still going through some growing pains, and when we brought the project in, uh, sponsored research had a really heck of a time trying to keep up with the workload, and uh, we agreed to uh, form a nonprofit but still have a relationship with our local universities. And at that time, I was on the board of directors with uh, rates and doing a retreat uh, that we, we have an annual retreat with the uh, with the coalition uh, where we talk about strategic planning and things like that. Uh, we pitched to them the idea of merging instead of creating a new nonprofit of merging with our uh, rates RGV and, and uh, that was that was agreed on and lo and behold, uh, now rates is the task force and the task force is rates, so to speak. Uh, let me go back a little bit. Uh, let's see, 1998, uh, Dr. Ernest and myself, we founded the group. Uh, this was in part, uh, those of you who are familiar with the TPDS program or the NPDS program, as the EPA is referred to, uh, back in 97, 98, uh, TCQ was providing workshops on how the TPDS program was going to work. Uh, the, 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 the rules were, were scary to a lot of our cities in the Valley. You know, because back then, you know, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, most of our cities were, were one-man teams. McAllen had two engineers uh, compared to what they have today, about 30. So uh, I was part of that group in McAllen, and we, we developed the first stormwater management plan to comply with those rules. And this was back in the late 90s. But, uh, but then the Coalition of Cities, uh, which was a coalition of cities in Texas, they sued the EPA. I don't know if you all remember that, but uh, EPA eventually, um, the EPA rules eventually, um, um, I don't say won, but there was some stipulations added to the language of the, of the rules, but it delayed the, the actual issue of the permit in Texas from 97 to 2003. So in 98, uh, the task force was doing different things, and I'm going to get into that in a, in a couple other slides, but the idea of growing or sharing information and, and, and combining our resources was born uh, at that time. We met the city of La Feria um, and, and there was maybe a handful of city managers there that, that proposed that why don't we create a task force, uh, enter into, in, at that time, in their local agreements with uh, A&M Kingsville, which we did. I think there was about, about 10 or 12 cities 
MS4s at that time that contracted with AM Kingsville. Everyone uh, put in a little bit of money. Uh, I think we had a small pot, about twenty thousand dollars. We thought that was a lot of money at the time, right? but uh, uh, the task force was born right after that. So uh, the mission is unique. Uh, we work we work closely with the TCEQ, the EPA. In fact, the the second round of the TPS MS4 rules uh, were kind of customized for us. You know, there is language in there for for the task force. Uh, I remember the 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 first year that we submitted an annual report, we had to submit uh, something like Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, but something like 20 individual annual reports, one for each entity, and it was the same annual report because we were sharing uh, uh, the uh, the information. But we ended up getting 20 different responses from the TCEQ, so it was it was chaos. But uh, now we we uh, under the new rules, we submit just one annual report. Uh, uh, based on a watershed-based stormwater management program that we've established over the years. But we also work with uh, the GLO, the Water Development Board, NADBank, NSF, and I'm sure I'm missing some there, but we've over the last 25 years, we've, we've done a lot of work. The primary role of the task force was to keep our MS4s in compliance, and we have not had a violation in 25 years. Uh, we've had some... Uh, uh, you know, little things that we've had to fix here and there, but but nothing major. And sometimes when a non-task force member gets audited and goes through enforcement, one of the uh, agreed orders uh, through the TCEQ stipulates that they join our, our group. And and that's done. That's been done, I think, three or four times already with some of our some of our cities. And um, let me see. Uh, now, let me go back again, the interlocal agreement. We have an interlocal agreement uh, with the universities that uh, was, was developed by, if I remember, was an A&M attorney uh, developed the language, and then we had uh, the city attorneys go through it. And that document, which has now converted into a, a memorandum of agreement, has not changed. You know, the, the, the jargon has not changed over 25 years. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a solid uh, contractual document for us. Now, in 2006, the task force modified its mission. Um, we uh, started working with uh, the watershed planning groups at the EPA and the TCEQ, namely the NPS programs. And I remember the task force back in the late 90s uh, worked with Dr. Dr. Jacob, who's uh, since retired, he's a colleague of mine, was with the Texas Sea Grant. And he submitted, if, I'm, if I remember, the first 319 application that founded the Arroyo Colorado Partnership. And that, that was the first uh, uh, watershed-driven uh, initiative in, in the state. And it was grandfathered in even before the, the NPS nine elements of the EPA. And it recently got approved um, uh, a watershed, uh, watershed protection plan approval about four or five years ago, if I'm not mistaken. But that was a great accomplishment for us. And we started doing a lot of NPS work. In 2008, um, I do want to mention that uh, we continued to grow, so we had more uh, interest from our staff uh, at the municipal level, so we started getting their hands dirty, so we started creating committees, uh, grant committees, scholarship committees, outreach committees, our, our scholars, for example, our scholarship committee, they, they developed uh, the guidelines to, to give out scholarships, and we started giving out four-year scholarships, and I think we have probably over 20 scholarships that we've issued for your scholarships over the years and uh, i'm going to say a good good uh, crop of those uh, kids are now um either leading public works departments or city engineers in fact i forgot to mention during that list of task force reps we actually have three of my ex-students now leading uh their stormwater programs at, at some of these municipalities um capacity building is one of our our, our big uh our uh, pet peeves there. Now, recently, these uh, committees have been replaced with work groups, you know, so these work groups now are actually doing some of the work. Uh, for example, we're installing RTHS systems uh, throughout the valley, and some of our public works folks are actually going out to the field and, and, and helping us, and, and at the same time learning um, uh, about remote sensing and things like that. Um, I put I asked uh, my graduate student here to put this in because Jason and I talked about this yesterday, but one of the biggest uh, work groups that we have is the LID work group. Uh, 
back in 2003, I'm going to say we received the largest 319 grant uh, TCQ has ever issued, from what I understand at that time. And it was almost $2 million. Uh, and and uh, it, we received it over about a three year period. And the gist of it was to install LID f uh, facilities throughout the valley from Brownsville all the way to La Jolla. And we actually still have these uh, um, uh, demonstration sites up and running. And AM Kingsville, in partnership with the task force, we're still monitoring, we're still studying. Uh, we're still convincing cities to incorporate LID into their uh, stormwater management programs, their drainage policies, their subdivision ordinances, uh, things like that. And we're seeing a lot of that uh, come to fruition in the, in, in the valley. So we're real proud of that. Uh, in 2017, like I said, uh, uh, we further expanded the NPS program. We now lead uh, some additional watershed protection plan projects, the Laguna Madre and Brownsville Ship Channel Partnership the Hidalgo Willis Floodway Partnership, the IBWC Floodway Partnership, and there's one missing, the Raymondville Drain Partnership. All these are, are part of uh, the 319 program. In fact, we had a huge workshop yesterday with our steering committees, and the task force uh, leads these projects, and, and they've been uh, instrumental in a lot of the work that we've been um, uh, uh, accomplishing down here. In 2019, um, we, uh, in fact, this dates back to a meeting we had at the EPA when we uh, started looking at the an estuary program in the valley, and and the EPA pretty much told us, you know, why don't you have one? I mean, it's it's not us; it's just you guys. You guys need to get together and, and, and get this done. So we, at A M Kingsville, when we were at A M Kingsville, we looked to the GLO, and they provided us uh, a a uh, CMP grant uh, for a strategic plan, which we developed, we implemented. We founded the partnership, uh, and we've been uh, we've we've got a board of directors. We created a nonprofit organization, and uh, today we're working with uh, our congressmen and our state officials to try and get some of the uh, national estuary program funding from uh, DC to the valley. And and uh, we we actually have uh, Zoom meetings with our with our federal uh, elected officials next week, and trying to trying to see if we can get that done. So this is all led by our task force uh, members. Now, let's see, this, this slide here talks about, let's see, yes, uh, applied research. We've been doing a lot of uh, grant uh, applications and we always incorporate some funding for some task force activity and it's worked out real well, you know, for workshops, for trainings. I think we've had GIS courses uh, funded We've had uh, Trimble units uh, paid for. We've had conferences, international conferences paid for through through uh, through grants, and and uh, and we're still doing that. We recently we just received a 5.5 million dollar uh, grant from the Texas Water Development Board for some uh, intelligent watershed initiatives that we're we're taking on here in the valley. Hey, have you had talk about our StormCon presentations? The StormCon. Yeah. Uh, StormCon reached out to us. I don't know if you're all familiar with the National StormCon uh, uh, group that meets annually throughout the country. The last three times they have been to Texas, they've reached out to us and we have uh, customized a track for them. Uh, and, and we've been very successful in. in uh, so we, we have some national recognition. I know that some of my colleagues and myself have been on panels at, at this national conference. And we continue to, to continue to engage uh, uh, other um, uh, conferences, like for example, the uh, uh, ASCE LID uh, uh, conference. When we were at Kingsville, uh, let me uh, digress a little bit here. When we were at Kingsville, we actually uh, were awarded the MS4 operator um, uh, contract to deliver the EPA MS4 conference. And I think last year was the last year of a six-year contract uh, that uh, AM Kingsville had, uh, and that was driven by the by the task force. So we we've got we've got our hands in pretty much uh, uh, everything. Now uh, I do want to just uh, talk about the local government perspective. Uh, uh, the mission, the uh, uh, as I, I can't see, I have a 
caption that's covering my my title. I'm so apologize, but stormwater quality is municipal responsibility. I think that's what it says. Um, if you if you know uh, everyone receives a utility bill in the mail, you know you get you get a, a water bill and a wastewater bill, but very few cities have a stormwater bill, and 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 you know citizens expect flood protection, flood management. But most local governments get their funding from their um, uh, general fund, and there, there really is no utility for for stormwater. So in the valley, uh, that was one of the things we undertook. So most of our cities already have a stormwater fee, and they they subsidize uh, a lot of their stormwater work through that. And a lot of our cities have already created their own stormwater departments and hired their own staff, and that was in in part due to the activities uh, of the task force. And uh, let's see now, yeah, that was important because a lot of uh, the stormwater responsibilities were add-ons uh, for a lot of the departments. So now what that means is the planning department had some responsibility, the police department had others, engineering, public works. And, and what we've done is consolidated everything under one, one department. And a lot of cities have taken that to heart. And uh, let's see. Um, so the timing of the regional uh, effort was was perfect for us. You know, the task force made sense. We pitched it to uh, our councils, our, our courts, and and lo and behold, you know, 25 years later, we're st we're still in existence. One of the things that we did, uh, one of the lessons learned that we did uh, um, uh, uh, uncover, I should say, is uh, you know we we have a lot of turnover and at the staff level, at the elected official level, in small cities. So a lot of the stormwater knowledge gets lost, you know? And so what we've done is when, when uh, let's say Melissa at City of Alamo, she moves on, the person who takes over, you know, we easily just bring them under wing and, and, and give them all the information, training, and, and that, that learning curve is flattened and they're up and running in no time. So that's one of the things that, that uh, we've, uh, we've learned over the years. Um, I'm gonna, I mean, lessons learned, there's, there's, probably hundreds of them, but uh, I'm only going to list a few. And, and Jason's, Jason, in fact, Jason said to, to leave you guys wanting more. So <laughs> uh, grant funding is one of the big things, uh, regional of matching funds, finding matching funds. So uh, if we need uh, case in point in this water development board project, we needed to come up with $800,000 match. Well, we don't have $800,000, not the task force, but Individually, combining resources, we did. We we came up with eight hundred thousand dollars worth of matching funds to match a uh, a seven point five million dollar project, and that was done with 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 this group. And we've been doing that uh, over the years with small grants. Um, also, if Melissa calls me and says, "Hey, I'm 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 sending this regional uh, grant application. I need forty letters of support," I I can get on the phone. And through our liaisons, uh, we can get 40 letters of support within a couple of days, uh, and, and sometimes more. So it's really it's really beneficial uh, having uh, contacts uh, not only at the city, but at other organizations that the cities work with. The school districts we have a liaison that we work with every ISD in the valley. The EDCs, Economic Development Corporation, we work with with them, uh, and that comes in handy also with when we're dealing with engineers, our partners, uh, consulting firms. You know, they, they provide jobs to our students. They provide sponsors, sponsorships for our trainings, our conferences. And every year we do have a, an annual conference. In fact, we're going to have our 25th annual conference this year. Hopefully for the first time we come together after three years, last two years, the last year was virtual. We didn't have one uh, the year before that, but this year we, we, uh, we we're already getting a lot of uh, uh, good feedback. We'll have it in June. I'm going to make that information available to the, the audience. And if, if you want to know about everything that we've done during the year, that annual conference is, is the place to be. And, and, and it's small. We have about 250 people that come through. It's a week long, but we have uh, hack res trainings. We have stormwater inspector trainings. Uh, we have an estuary round table and, and our keynotes are, are, are uh, staples. You know, we have last year we had a, our state controller was there. We've had commissioners from TCEQ, uh, uh, board of directors from the Water Development Board, GLO folks. Uh, Bush came out down one time and spoke, was one of our keynotes. So uh, it's it's a very good quality conference, and, and uh, uh, we do have a good presence from the GLO. I know Jason's been uh, presenting there every year, the last few years. Um, 
policy change through applied research, uh, like the LID project. You know, uh, you show the elected officials through science that policies work. They'll they'll understand it, and and they'll change change the rules. So, municipal municipalities and local governments uh, are are powerful tools for uh, implementing uh, initiatives like stormwater management, uh, even any type of ecosystem related uh, initiatives, because uh, th they make the rules, you know, and 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 you got to follow them. Centralization of knowledge. Okay, I've already talked about that. That's uh, regarding turnover, staff and turnover. You know, we, we, we have the information that is passed on. Uh, and then we work as a group, you know, uh, locally at the state level, federal level. We, we, we send delegations everywhere we can to support legislation and subcommittee. Uh, in fact, next week, uh, we've been invited to a panel discussion. Uh, we are going to have three panelists from our task force uh, in Galveston. Uh, uh, Corps of Engineers is hosting a forum on the 24th. Some of you may be uh, attending. I know it's available through Zoom. If you want that information, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it out to you. Uh, but we are leaving on the 22nd and we'll be at the AM campus there in Galveston uh, as a panelist and presenting uh, to the Corps of Engineers there. But um, let's see, key accomplishments, uh, our scholarship program, we, we, uh, our 319 program, do want to mention a little bit about our watershed coordinator. I, I heard we had some council of governments in the audience. Uh, we have a watershed coordinator that is a rates employee that is soft money funded. It's uh, this individual is funded by four entities. In fact, rates doesn't have to lift. The, uh, we don't have to pay anything uh, for this salary. It's funded by Willisie County, Cameron County, Hidalgo County, and the council of governments. We have an office there at the council in Westlaco. And this individual oversees all our watershed projects in the valley and, and works with uh, all our local governments. And uh, it's been a very success. In fact, the, he's got an office in every county and, and we work closely with our, with our uh, uh, regulators. Internships, we, uh, our cities provide internships for our, our uh, graduate students, sometimes undergraduate students that we work with. And, and uh, sometimes these individuals stay on and I'm very proud to say that uh, I have a lot of ex-students uh, running departments. Uh, case in point, one, one Hern uh, Joaquin Hernandez just took on the Poly Works Director at the City Mercedes. And, and uh, we, we see that at the city manager level, city engineer level, and that just makes easy, uh, life easy on us for us when we need something. Uh, we also founded the Regional Water Resources Advisory Committee. This is the first advisory committee of this sort that advises our council of governments. It's uh, comprised of 13 individuals, myself, Jose, uh, Jose and Jose and Melissa are on this group. And, and we pretty much uh, advise all our mayors, all our commissioners that come together once a month on, on water resources issues. We also lead the Freshwater Flows Program on the Water Development Board. We have numerous coastal management program initiatives, uh, namely uh, one of them, the uh, estuary program that we're, that we're uh, uh, spearheading. And uh, as a group, like I said, we have uh, a, a lot of clout and we continue to, we continue to grow. That's all I got. So um, hopefully I uh, didn't bore you to death, but we're real proud of this task force. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a little gold mine for us and we continue, like I said, continue to grow. We still work with a lot of our universities. Uh, we have a contract with UTEP. Uh, University of Texas of El Paso, UT Austin, UTRGV, uh, AM Kingsville, uh, STC, South Texas College. Uh, our scholarship program, though, we, we've kind of uh, pulled back a little bit and we only offer scholarships to our local universities. So if we issue a scholarship, you have to be at UTRGV, AM Kingsville, uh, STC, or Texas Southmost. So, uh, but um, Joe and Melissa are here to answer questions. I'll take on any questions. Uh, you might want to touch on the funding that's become available through the task force to, to the uh, whole area, the whole region. I know it's it's a hard task. There's a lot of funding that's come in, but I don't know if you had to put a figure on it. Javier, what would you oh, say? Oh, jeez. Uh, oh, well, just this one project is $7.4 million. Now, the flood infrastructure fund project uh, if you all remember, that was a referendum that came into play in November 2019. It passed. We were very instrumental in getting uh, support in South Texas. This was a, a bill that was led by uh, uh, State Representative Phelan. I think he's the Speaker of the House now. And, and the first 
uh, uh, first cycle of funding, which was close to a billion, a billion with a B, a billion dollars, $800 million was injected into the state uh, within a year. Uh, and, and we ended up getting 33 projects in the valley, something to the tune of over, geez, I'm going to say over, over $30 million. So, uh, and we can, and we also, um, uh, the 319 program has been very, very good to us. You know, we, we could, I could probably say over $10 million has come in, uh, into the region and, you know, the numbers add up. You, uh, you mentioned a lot of cities, uh, but there's actually, uh, some, uh, county, uh, some drainage districts and some counties, obviously, that you mentioned that are part of our program. Uh, I run an irrigation district uh, in the sense that uh, water resources encompass not only drainage, but, but also water availability. Uh, I'm trying to bridge that gap uh, to make sure that the agricultural community and the urban community are all working together because we're all in the same little bowl uh, of the necessities for, for the water, limited water resource we have. So uh, I want to make sure that in irrigation districts are also involved in any conversations regarding infrastructure. All too often, that's, a, that's a, an elusive kind of connection. But other than maybe two or three cities in the valley, all the other cities uh, rely on the 20 plus irrigation districts to supply them with water. So anyway, we're trying to bridge that uh, gap uh, in, and, uh, and create this network that's uh, viable and, and critical to this whole area. And uh, the task force was a great template for that. And we're looking forward to even more accomplishments uh, on that, uh, on that uh, front. Thank you. And I just wanna add, um, if you give me a minute, uh, from being from a small city here in the city of Alamo, we don't have a lot of resources for uh, big projects. So being part of the task force has really helped us do a lot of um, pilot projects here in Alamo. Um, but I think the most the most uh, rewarding thing to us is the knowledge that the task force brings us. Uh, we're in the middle of constructing a new wastewater treatment plant, and we needed to come up with our uh, stormwater management plan for our new wastewater treatment plant. And the rates did it for us. You know, part of our as part of our partnership, they developed it for us. We submitted it, and it was great. So not only do they offer the knowledge, but they offer the help. Um, they've helped small cities prepare grant applications if you're part of the task force. So we all work together at, to get projects, not only for individual cities, but that'll benefit our cities, but also our region. So that's the most, I've been part of the task force for 12 years now. And I love to say that I, I was the first woman, chairwoman, yay, uh, to lead all the men. And it's a lot of fun because these, I mean, everybody's smart. Uh, everybody brings something to the table and working collectively, we've done some really good work down here in our, in our region. So I'm very proud of being part of it and I'm very proud of the work that we've done. So that's what I wanna add. Well, well, thank you for that. And Javier, if you'd like, you can quit sharing your screen so we can uh, see, see all the participants. And, and uh, Joe, Melissa, thank you for sharing that information there. Uh, I wanted to, to double back to uh, a couple of points you made and, and uh, also remind folks that uh, we, we are reviewing the chat questions and we'll start teeing those up here momentarily. Um, Javier said a couple of things in his presentation that, that captured me. One was the, uh, <clears throat> you, were, you, were, you were very elegant and in the way you talked about the, the uh, exchange of turnover from elected officials and staff over time. And, and that is one of the most significant stumbling blocks that seems to be a consistent theme um, over groups kind of wherever they are and where they're working. I was wondering if you, um, you, you, you kind of, you, you mentioned it, it sounds so smooth. I was, I was just, I was right there along with you, but I know there's so much more work associated with that. Can you unpack that just a little bit for us? Yes. Uh... Elections sometimes happen every two years, three years, four years, depending on, on the local government. So we do see a lot of turnover in the council area and in turn with city manager, the leadership type. Uh, case in point, Harlingen, you know, had a leadership change and they ended up losing their city manager, assistant city manager, their stormwater manager and their city engineer. So uh, we have to wait till the cloud settles, see who's going to be taking <laughs> taking over. And then we go and visit 
you know, we, we started having workshops. We started having presentations with them again. And, and uh, it's time consuming, especially when you have 30 local governments. And so if you have 30 changes and, and really that's the, the network is built on relationships. And, and I have myself and one other couple other individuals have that relationship with these individuals. Um, one being an elected official, ex elected official myself, it's a fraternity, uh, so to speak. And uh, being a, a local government uh, staffer, so I can relate to them. And, and many times, like I said, these, these are uh, students, ex-students that, that we work with. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's not easy, you know, because we have to, we have to uh, uh, engage these individuals. Now, the value is very fickle. You know, they, they like to see you face to face. They like a handshake. And it's still the case, even with all this Zoom stuff, they still want to meet you for lunch. They still want to meet you for breakfast. Uh, when we started the task force, uh, we actually, and Joe can attest to this, we actually started the task force with, uh, with uh, the perspective of a political campaign. We actually had pachangas. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that, that word, but that's a, that's a little barbecue and that, 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 that you have and you break bread. And, and we did that at, at my ranch. I had a ranch up in, in Elsa and, and every weekend I'd go down, uh, Dr. Ernest and I would go down and we'd invite three or four people and sit down and break bread. Uh, if, if uh, McAllen didn't like Westlaco or Westlaco didn't like, uh, uh, that's not the case anymore. Oh, well, to some degree, I mean, you still see that type of uh, uh, bickering, but for the most part, that's been eliminated. We, we work real well together now, but uh, the staff, you know, we get a, we had a green kid uh, out of college or, or, or coming in from another industry. We've got to spend time with them uh, uh, doing the uh, TPDS 101, you know, you know, a lot of the veterans. So a lot of our veterans, we take advantage of like Joe's and Melissa's, we be, we, we, uh, Pass that to them to befriend somebody at the city of Alton that may be just coming on board and, and they start sharing information. Uh, if they're getting audited, they'll, they'll, they'll provide support. If, if uh, they need help with inspections, uh, you know, a lot of our cities have interlocal agreements within themselves, you know, uh, to help each other out. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not easy. I mean, I, I didn't uh, hope it, it didn't appear that way, but it, it takes a lot of time. So I spend probably, uh, uh, geez, I can't even tell you. I mean, weekends, dinners, evenings, uh, meeting with folks and 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 trying to trying to educate them on on a lot of the work that we're doing. There's a lot of them. No, no. Well, well, thank you for that. And and uh, I, th I think a big piece of your message there was about the relationships. But it, an underscore of that is understanding their points of view, their perspectives, their values, and how those weigh into the collective. So, so thank you for that. I'll, I'm I'm going to ask one more follow up and then turn it over to Brian Desanti. Uh, for the for the for some more questions from the audience as well, um, GI master planning, uh, green infrastructure master planning. Of course, we we understand that how we what we do on the land, how we plan around that impacts our water quality. Often we see a dynamic where some of the the older biz, uh, building practices or storm drainage practices might might use uh, some of the other um, you know older proven practices such as concrete channels and pushing the water downhill as quickly as possible. So the idea of, of a, a city Mercedes developing a, a GI master plan um, is, is phenomenal um, and, and for anywhere. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit with the group of, about the development for that and, and what yeah. it's doing. Well, before I get into that, I wanna add a little something to the previous discussion. Uh, the task force representation, you know, initially when we, in 98, when we formed it, uh, we actually tasked, we actually asked uh, elected officials to be the representatives, you know, the mayors and the city commissioners and, and, and county commissioners. Uh, but that fizzled, you know, they, they just had other things to do. Uh, they, they really didn't get it. Uh, they wanted to, they, they want to be part of every board there is, right? But, but this one was more, it was a little different. Uh, a lot of smaller cities then started adding their consultants because consultants viewed the stormwater rules back then as another revenue source. But when the task force came along, a consultant starting to realize that that wasn't the case. This, this group was not about money making, you know, so they, they fizzled off. So it took us about two or three years to realize that we had to engage staff, middle management and upper management and have them to buy in, uh, especially the department heads and, and the, and the managers, uh, you convince them 
they'll do the work for you, you know, and, and that's worked out real well. And uh, sometimes uh, Joe will present a, an item for the task force uh, in Brownsville or, or in McAllen. And he's done that also. Some of a lot of our other staffs will do that uh, because there's just so many local or I can't be, sometimes there's like five council me meetings in one day and I can't be there five times in, in five different locations. So we, we, uh, we delegate, uh, the information. Uh, anyway, so going back to the, uh, LID now, uh, like I said, in 2003, we received a huge, uh, funding award from TCEQ and we, we actually designed, installed, uh, actual real world functioning LID demonstration sites, uh, recreation centers with uh, pervious paving. We had uh, the Valley Nature Center with the grass roof, uh, uh, with a green roof, which someone told us hey, that will never work in the Valley. Hey, it's still there today. You know, uh, pervious paving, uh, uh, rain harvesting. You know, so we had them at, uh, we had them at libraries, at city halls, uh, parks, uh, 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 pervious uh, concrete, pavers, uh, bioretention center, uh, uh, systems, uh, bioswells, all sorts of, all sorts of projects that we've, we've, uh, we've funded over the years that started with that, with that injection of $2 million from the, from the, from the TCEQ. And we're still doing it today. Uh, the <laughs> supplemental environmental program, which is uh, in a, through the enforcement group at TCEQ, anytime one of our cities is under enforcement, guess who gets the SCP? The task force. So instead of having the fine uh, uh, pay uh, uh, the TCQ the fine, we invested in L and in some type of LID uh, program uh, and 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 make it an educational uh, part of the educational curriculum with UTRGV and MKZO or whoever. We're still doing that. So anyway, when we sold the idea of a um, um, uh, the uh, LID. I lost my train of thought here. What is what is the uh, green infrastructure? GI? Yeah, the green infrastructure plan with the city Mercedes. We we pitched it to the Border 2020 program or the EPA, and they gave us funding for it, and we developed it. And the Mercedes is now incorporating it into their stormwater management program. Uh, they're building. Uh, there are uh, I think part of the work was to identify all the. And this makes LID initiatives easier when you own the land, right? So they identified all the corner clips, all the bus stops, all the right-of-ways, all the easements that they own, they inventoried them, and then they started prioritizing the areas with regards to flooding. So if an intersection flooded, flood floods, they would uh, upgrade their sidewalk and, and, and put in some subsurface uh, 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 detention, which... which which is the case in a near city hall in Mercedes, there is a, a pervious paving sidewalk that went to alleviate uh, some flooding at an intersection. And the language is now being seen in the uh, drainage policy. So uh, so now you're seeing uh, proprietary uh, underground detention at Burger King, you know, and, 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 and the city engineers who review the plans understand uh, what it entails because you're right, you know, the old school paradigm was move the water to the neighbor, move it to the, to the off the site as fast as possible. But we're training our, our students and, and our stormwater managers to hold the water uh, 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 as much as possible. One of the representatives from the city of Harlingen, he's the uh, president of the local planning association. Uh, uh, and, and so he, we have workshops with them and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, and we work with architects also and, and pitch the idea. So uh, we're hoping this catches on with other cities. We're, 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 we're having uh, uh, workshops with them. a and Kingsville, we will work with them also. I think they recently had a workshop uh, with a lot of our cities, which we facilitate for them, talking about the LID demonstration sites because that was done under the a and Kingsville umbrella. But but still, we still work with In fact, they still have a 319 grant that's, that's monitoring these things uh, to see how they're performing. And I think we're fixing to submit one in this summer to retrofit uh, with our new technology, the RTH system that we're peddling, uh, instead of going out there and, and grabbing samples and, and, and automatic samples, which are very expensive, we have a new system that, that, that hopefully in real time uh, data can, 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 um, can help us. So. Well, thank you for that. Um, uh, Brian DeSanti, uh, our GLO NOAA Coastal Fellow, would you like to um, help mm -hmm. share some of the questions from the audience with us? Thank you, Jason. Absolutely. Uh, Javier, thank you for you know, showing off 
uh, everything you guys have been accomplishing and you know working on. Uh, that, that was a, a lot of information there. Uh, we definitely got some questions. Uh, I want to start with uh, Dr. Sosa's question. She had her hand raised. So I can give you a second if you'd like to pop back on and ask. Otherwise, I can read it directly out of the chat. So I'll, I'll give you a second if that's something you want to do. You can go ahead. OK. Um, Dr. Sosa asked, how do you include conservation and outreach in your programs? In particular, how important is reclamation and restoration to your organization? Well, it, it's very important. Um, in fact, Jeff Lapey from Washington, D.C. EPA, who uh, at that time headed their reclamation program, is now one of our board members. Uh, he recently uh, joined our, our, our uh, uh, nonprofit group, and he's going to be tasked with trying to bring that idea down to South Texas. Now, Hidalgo County, uh, which is one of our big task force members, in fact, two of their precincts fund our programs, they just uh, started uh, a reclamation project they've got four in fact Joey Nahosa, who's the chair I if I'm not mistaken Joe I think Hidalgo County has proposed to purchase your lake and turn it into a reclamation uh, detention system uh, correct and, and the county has just Hidalgo County is the first county to gain water rights to where they will be able to sell the water that they reclaim stormwater that they're going to eventually clean and 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 and, and reclaim and sell back to cities and irrigation districts. Uh, that's still down the line. That's in the that's in the pro, in the process right now. We're providing support. In fact, we took a, a delegation to California to Santa Monica because they have some some reclamation systems over there that 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 we modeled ours after. So it it's it's big. A reclamation is not something that we've gotten into 100% yet, but it's getting there. I know Melissa's team over in Alamo, they've been looking at uh, San Antonio's Purple Pipe uh initiatives over there so uh hopefully the purple pipe idea will catch on in the valley we're going to be pushing it and so yeah it, it's it's big for us so well, you know we haven't like I said gone into it 100 percent right now flood uh, management uh resili resiliency is 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 big with us but uh like i said we're bringing on jeff lapey on board if you can google his name jeff lapey l-a-p-e he's not part of our board of directors you'll you'll see his background and and hopefully uh, I know he's going to be presenting at our uh, RERAC, uh, WR, our WRAC, that advisory committee that I talked about previously. I know he's going to be presenting to our group uh, to see how we can uh, help uh, that initiative down here in the Valley. Thanks for the question, Dr. Sosa. All right. Thank you for the detailed explanation on that. Uh, I've got a question from Rebecca, and she wanted to where can we find more information on the internships and are they only for undergraduates or can they, you know, can other people apply? We, we have, uh, it depends on the uh, availability from the cities. Right now the cities uh, are probably entertaining their budgets for the next year. Correct me if I'm wrong, Liz, right? Uh, so, so we will know how many internships we'll have for, for uh, this coming year and how much scholarship money we will have. Now, our, our conference, most of that funding goes to scholarships. You know, so, so if, we, if we raise $30,000, $40,000, you know, we'll have 80% of that available for scholarships. Uh, and and so, so we, we did hire someone specifically to go after sponsors uh, this year, and, and hopefully uh, we'll make that available. So you do have to have a degree, uh, pursuing a degree in science, whether it's geology or engineering, preferably, but but environmental, and it's a four-year scholarship. I think it's fifteen hundred dollars a year for four years, renewable aid every year, depending on criteria. Uh, you South Texas College, TSTC, Texas Southmost, and in Kingsville. Those are the only schools that we will we will uh, lend or uh, award to, oh, and and. Um, Let's see, the internships, uh, they're undergraduate and graduate. Uh, I know the, for example, city of Westlaco has two every summer and they're, they're, they can be either or. Uh, we usually pair an, a graduate and undergraduate student when we do that uh, for obvious reasons, right? Because you never know what you're gonna get with a freshman. <laughs> but uh, but uh, our graduate students usually uh, intern with a city 
but then they intern with rates. So if you get a scholarship from rates, you sign a contract that you're going to be at our beck and call for at least 10 hours a week. So if we need you out in the field at 120 degree weather, installing these RTHS, Hey, you're going to be out there. <laughs> so, but you do get a scholarship uh, for it and you get paid uh, uh, like $10 an hour. Uh, graduate uh, internships are a little bit more professional. I know that uh, again, the city of Westaco, they, and the, uh, I know another one recently, Cameron County, they, they uh, funded a intern to be an actual staff engineer uh, housed at, at, uh, at, at, at the uh, city and at the county. And they funded the project at $50,000 salary. So we, we provided a $25,000 match and they provided the other 25,000. And these kids, they transition into, into uh, I know one has transitioned to Alton, city of Elsa, Cameron County. In fact, the one in Cameron County now heads a department. Uh, city Mercedes, uh, Alamo, you guys, Alamo, Melissa's uh, trying to get funding right now for one intern. Uh, what are you gonna have that intern do, Melissa? The GIS, we want um, our uh, stormwater system, um, the guy that used to do our GIS passed away. So we've got shape files. So we need um, somebody to take our shape files and kind of create our stormwater system, GIS system again, um, to help my stormwater specialist, as well as um, work with my stormwater specialist on, on some uh, on the LID project we have. Here in Alamo, we have actually, we have one of the 319 pilot projects, uh, which is a green wall with a rain harvest, solar uh, powered rain harvesting system with some Permian paper uh, pavers with signage and planters. So we do have people that come by and, and educate themselves. Um, the hardest thing we have in Alamo is that they steal the plants off of our green wall. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have beautiful green walls and then a week later, there's no plants. So we, we laugh at the fact that we'll just have to go to the flea market down the street and we can probably find our plants there. But it's that's one of the things that we deal with. Uh, our fence, our project is fenced in, but you know, kids can jump fences and for some reason they just love our plants. Um, so you do have some issues, but they're not big issues. I think one of the coolest things uh, that uh, EPA, TCEQ actually, when Tim was here to see our project when we were constructing it, I was really nervous because you know, you never know when you do a pilot project how TCEQ is gonna to respond to the actual uh, stuff that we're doing. Well, I remember uh, we had, Tim was here and we also had um, Arthur, remember the-, the TCEQ, Arthur Talley. Dr. Talley. And I was a little nervous and he's, the, I remember that he looked at me and he said, okay, the only question I have for you is why did you dream so small? Why is your <laughs> pilot project so small? And then I thought, oh man, I should have gone to the big, big, big wigs. But again, these are just learning opportunities for us. Um, it is our per our 319 projects that are around the valley. They, as part of the, the task force, I've been able to see them from the bottom up. And they're just amazing projects. I advise, I encourage everybody to come out and see um, our project, like the fire station at Alton. They actually, there's a fire station that has part of our 319 project. That's their pervious driveway. So you have fire trucks that are actually doing um, and, and are, you know, going over LID project stuff every day. So it, it's, we are transitioning, we are learning, we are trying to get people educated. That does help um, our engineers and our architects. The hardest fight I have is with my engineers because of the cost LID um, projects have. So you kind of have to start educating your engineers and say, yeah, it may cost a little bit more, but in the long run, it's better for the environment. So it's all about educating, working with everybody. But again, it's, I can I can speak a lot. I can speak more than Javier, if that's possible, and Dr. <laughs> Andy. So I'm gonna stop because I'll keep going. So thank you yeah. for asking. <laughs> Jason, uh, one of the things uh, is cost. You know that 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 that's still a, a a an issue, but sometimes it's a misconception. You know, uh, you know the LID cost has gone down considerably. Where, uh, uh, for example, uh, and it depends on the circumstances. South Texas College, uh, their engineer, their private sector engineer, reached out to us uh, when he was designing a parking lot north of their Pecan campus, and there was a vacant lot where he needed to put in about a hundred stalls. Right, and because McAllen has such strict uh, ordinances with regards to drainage, uh, trees, shrubs, 
uh, uh, easements and things like that, he could only put 20, 20 stalls. So it wasn't, it wasn't worth the while. So he reached out to us and we designed a, a uh, subsurface detention, uh, bioswell, bioretention system, and uh, uh, reduced uh, the detention footprint uh, almost in half. And he was able to get 90 stalls in. And, and today, that that facility is now in place and South Texas College now requires that design and all their new construction, you know, and 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 uh, we have monitored that site for a long time. In fact, we have published three papers uh, on that uh, through thesis and dissertations, and I can make some of those available to you all. Uh, uh, in fact, we've we've had, we've been publishing a lot of papers regarding the regional detention facilities uh, in McAllen, the the rec center in 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 La Feria, uh, uh, the park, the drainage district in, in in Brownsville. So we we have all that information, and 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 the the stuff works, you know, and 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 we need it because we're all our cities are landlocked now. So, you know, and, and, and uh, well, most of our cities, except maybe Edinburgh, right, or McAllen, they're still growing to the north. But, uh, you know, we're going to have to start um, looking at the subsurface uh, more so for our, our detention requirements, because we're so flat. Anyway. Well, yeah, thank you for expanding all that and, you know, giving us a, a lot to think about. Uh, and in the interest of everybody's time, uh, we're going to stop taking questions from uh, chat. And so, Javier, you know, and you know, everyone you invited, I won't name everybody. Thank you for uh, you know all of the information you've provided us with. And I want to everybody on this call. I want to give you a heads up on the next few lunch and learns. So next month, we're going to uh, have uh, Catherine Eggman from. Uh, Miami Aid Resiliency Group, and they're going to talk about some of the coastal issues they've been dealing with and how they've been resolving them uh, along their coast as they're dealing with many similar issues that we're seeing here in Texas. Uh, in April, we're going to have uh, Katie Swanson from the Mission Aransas National Estuary Research Reserve, and she's going to be talking about some of the effects uh, that that area, a pristine area that's you know less developed, uh, what some of the coastal issues that have been facing there and tying it back to water quality. And then in May, uh, you gotta, you guys get to you get to listen to me talk for a little while, as well as our Beach Watch program manager Lucy Flores, and we're gonna talk about Texas Beach Watch and you know what that's you know just give you an overview of that as you go into beach season. Uh, and with that, I will pass it back to Jason for any closing remarks. Thank you for that, and I just have to say, wow, um, Javier, M Melissa, and Joe, uh, thank you for for coming on and sharing the information. Uh, just a couple of highlights um, here that, that continue to echo in my brain. Um, you know, while the group, if I have this right, may have been formed initially with the intent to aid in meeting a regulatory requirement, um, it's fantastic to see how y'all have taken that mission. Uh, you've wrestled it down, but you've actually expanded quite a bit beyond that initial intent and requirement, uh, which is a, an amazing part of the story. Uh, what you touched on a minute ago uh, regarding the, the efforts to do the reclamation, flood storage, and polishing, um, and even water rights. That right there could be a whole track all by itself. Uh, we want to learn more about that as that begins to form. Um, that could bring a lot of fruits, of course, to your area, but maybe that's something that could be applied elsewhere. Um, of course, with your focus on uh, your green infrastructure, um, the focus on staff and elected official turnover, Training for future professionals, along with the scholarship opportunities, employment, uh, along with that, um, the longevity of the program is, is incredible and success story alone, and, and just the great partnerships and collaboration. Um, you know, while some of our other lunch and learns have focused more on, on the, the hard science um, of, of things, and, and science doesn't occur, things don't occur without people, people working together and collaborating. I think you've done a great job of, of sharing that story. And we, we do thank you very much. And folks, uh, visit their website for more information about the conference coming up and other activities associated with that. Um, finally, I'd like to thank uh, the Clean Coast Texas Collaborative and Partnership, which consists of Texas State University Meadows Center for Water and the Environment, and Ali Schlant and Anna Huff, who have helped us host today, as well as our other collaborative partners um, with Texas Community Watershed Partners, as well as Texas Sea Grant. And we want to thank you all uh, 
tech, uh, the Clean Coast Texas program continues to seek uh, partnerships with uh, counties, uh, cities, jurisdictions, and other planning authorities in the coastal zone. We're available for more information at cleancoast.texas.gov. Until next month, y'all have a fantastic day. Thank you so much.